regular board meeting is now called to order. We will start with the presentation of the colors by the Robert E. Lee High School RO, Junior ROTC. <coughs> Should everybody stand, ma'am? Please stand for the posting of the colors. Colors. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. this opportunity as well as privilege just to come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. We come, our Father, asking for your divine intervention as we come before you and make decisions that will impact the lives of the students and the communities we serve. We ask that the decisions that we make, our Father, be fact-based, data-driven, and in the best interest of those students and the communities as we serve. Lord, these and all other blessings we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the revised agenda? Madam President, I move that we approve the revised agenda. Second. It has been moved and seconded that we approve the revised agenda. Those in favor, please raise your hand. The motion is carried with seven votes. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we hear so many sad stories about people who get in trouble and there's nobody that steps up to help them. Well, tonight we're going to recognize some good Samaritans from Lanier High School whose actions probably saved the life of an infant who was abandoned on South Court Street just before the start of the school year. At this time, with Lanier High School students, Kentarius Hilton, Darius Johnson, and Deontay Martin, please come forward. Let's give them a hand as they come. I think that we can all agree that when we heard news of a baby that was found abandoned on South Court Street, 
behind the St. James Missionary Baptist Church marquee at the start of the school year was pretty disturbing. After the initial shock of what happened, we were pleased to learn that it was MPS students who found the baby. They were on their way to play basketball at the Bellingraph Middle School gym, and they heard the cries of a baby. And, you know, they could have gone on about what they were doing. They didn't have to stop, but they did. And so they looked behind the marquee and found a baby. The baby wasn't clothed. The baby was clearly in distress, and it was hot. So they picked up the baby. They took the baby to the Bellingraph gym to the school where they were able to call and get help. So that's why we're recognizing them today. I think that this is a reflection of the values that their parents have taught them. Are your parents here tonight? Would you please stand, parents? And I think it's also, you can continue to stand. I think it's also a reflection of what they're doing new at Lanier this year. It's Principal Antonio Williams here. He ducked in in the back. Stand up, Dr. Williams. This year they have the theme, Reclaiming the Castle, and that's reclaiming the pride, the spirit of the Lanier Poets. Now I'm a, a lead general, so I'm, I'm not going to poo-poo that. I think it's great, but they are reclaiming, uh, reclaiming the castle, and I think that those values are being instilled in the students at Lanier, which is great. And so for your commitment to good citizenship, we are recognizing you tonight with these uh, certificates. Oh, they have them already. Okay. Well, they were hiding them. I didn't know they had them. These young men were also recognized by the Montgomery City Council, and uh, they've also been featured on the news. Tanitria knows about that. She covered the story. So uh, we're very proud of what you all have accomplished. Thank you so much. And we put before they leave, I forgot. Uh, Katie Brown has something special she wants to do. Yes, uh, at the city council meeting, they gave them certificates, and I, I told them, I said, uh, they're young men and they need something in their pockets. <laughs> so therefore, I told them I committed myself to $25 for each one of them, and uh, Robert Porterfield and uh, David Burkett were supposed to get some saving bonds, but they did not get the saving bonds. <laughs> And they convinced me that the $25 would be better than the saving bonds because we can spend the $25 right now. So I want to thank Ms. Sykes. Uh, uh, when I came here and told her I left it at home on the dresser uh, and I needed some change, she, she, she felt sorry for me and gave me $25 on the $75. So tonight I would like to present you with these $25 to spend. Oh. Aww. Aww. Thank you. And I'll hold the other 25 if you want me to. <laughs> I said I'll hold the 25 if you want me to. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, young man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Give him another hand. Okay, next we'd like to recognize three teachers who won cash for their classrooms as part of the Shops at East Chase Shop to Moon Rewards Teacher Essay Contest. And with us tonight are Lanier High School teacher Ken Spear. I think our Blue Tech teacher Vera Yoshenkov, who's, I don't think she's here. Are you here, Vera? And Macmillan International teacher Kathy Simmons. Lawrence, who's the marketing manager for East Chase, wanted to be here personally and present the check. She actually, she still has the checks, but she was in an accident this afternoon, so our thoughts and prayers are with her. But this summer, teachers around our school district were invited to write an essay for the East Chase Shop the Moon contest, essay contest, and uh, these teachers were selected out of the uh, many entries that the shops at East Chase received. Ken Spears, who's an English language arts and journalism teacher at Lanier, placed first in the contest and received $500. Wow. He 
We actually received more than that because those who participated in the East Chase promotion for every $250 people spent in East Chase, he's getting an additional $5 up to $1,000. And I think uh, Vicky told me <laughs> Vicky told me that they got pretty close to a thousand. So you'll have uh, almost a thousand dollars to go with the five hundred dollars. Oh wow! Oh, so I think that's pretty great. And I don't know if you all remember this, but Ken also won this last year. I think you got second place last year, didn't you? Second. So he's yeah. improving. <laughs> he's improving. Um, Rutan teacher uh, Vera Yushakov, who is not here, got a hundred dollars, and McMillan International Academy teacher Kathy Simmons placed third, and she got a fifty-dollar gift card. So we want to congratulate these teachers, not for just you know they got the money, that's good, but the fact that they're proactive in looking for ways to find money for their classrooms. You know, this is not something they had to do or was forced to do. This is something that they wanted to do. And for that, we are recognizing you tonight. Thank you so much. Dr. Williams, you can stand again, Dr. Williams. Yeah. So, you're probably supposed to offer us enough money. And then this is Angela. Angela, no, Angela, 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 and uh, we had 30 of our schools participate in the Hunger Action Month sticker drive. And if you look at your um, seats, you could see a list of the schools that participated as well as um, how much money they raised. But tonight we're here to recognize those top fundraisers. And with us is Halcyon Elementary Assistant Principal Faith Goshi. Faith? She's coming. <laughs> Blunt Elementary Assistant Principal, LaShonda Moore. LaShonda. And Principal Dr. William Millage, who's Principal of Fitzpatrick Elementary. Over the course of two days, September 2nd and 3rd, our students uh, were tasked to give a donation to the Montgomery Area Food Bank. Now, the suggested donation was a dollar, but we knew many of our students gave loose change. And collectively, we as a district gave $6,667.13 to the food bank. And Superintendent Allen was there at the rally when we presented the check to the food bank. But our top winners were Halcyon Elementary School, and they had the highest percentage of stickers sold was $700. And Ms. Angela Kennedy, is she here? Ms. Kennedy, would you stand? <laughs> Ms. Kennedy's first grade class sold the most at House Neon. So the younger lead the older. <laughs> and Blunt Elementary came in second place with the second highest percentage. They also sold 700 followed by Fitzpatrick Elementary, who sold 409. And I'd also like to take this time to publicly recognize local school accounting. Uh, I think Ms. Fenderson couldn't be here tonight, but they were responsible for all the accounting and for working with the bookkeepers to get all that money in, which was quite a feat over two days' time. So I wanted to thank them publicly for that, too. But with the money that NPS raised, we were able to purchase, well, the food bank will be able to purchase more than 40,000 pounds of food that will feed people right here in our community. So for that, I want to congratulate you all for being the top sellers and also for all of our schools that participated. Thank you. Last week, we were pleased to learn that the wonderful outdoor experiences that our students get at the MPS Arboretum was going to be recognized by the Alabama Wildlife Federation. And last Friday, a group officially certified the Arboretum as an Alabama outdoor classroom. And to come celebrate that is Cindy McKenzie, who is the Arboretum Director. Cindy, would you please come in? And Brian Cooley, would you please come in? 
The Alabama Wildlife Federation has certified the NPS Arboretum Nature Center as a certified Alabama outdoor classroom. Ms. McKenzie applied for the uh, designation in April, and the Arboretum was certified because of its rich outdoor learning experiences uh, for our students. In addition, I don't know if any of you have been out there lately, but in addition to the wooded areas, the Nature Center has a small pond stocked with bass and brim. And for many of our students, that's the first time that they've ever uh, gone fishing. So it's quite a learning experience for them. It connects uh, children to learning about gardening and participating in a lot of hands-on uh, activities and commuting and getting to know and respect nature. So for that, we want to congratulate you for that certification and for what you're doing for our students to uh, connect them more to our environment. Thank you, but we also plan adult fishing. Okay. And we also have adult fishing the first time. Okay. You don't have fish, just come and visit. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Brian. Okay, we've got one more. Tonight we have a special treat for you. A demonstration from what uh, some of our students at Wears Ferry have been learning as a part of the AUM Confucius Institute. Uh, Wears Ferry has been a part of this program for two years, and there's a teacher that actually comes to them four days a week. And students at Wears Ferry are learning Chinese, and they're learning all about uh, the culture. So we thought that was something interesting and wanted to bring that to you. So just for a few minutes, we've got some students from Wears Ferry who are going to do a cheer for you, something they've learned, and uh, I suspect it's in Chinese, so. Where's Barry? Let's give them some encouragement at this time. And their principal, Ed Rauskowski, is here. Ed? And Ed has promised uh, not to do the cheer with <laughs> We also want to recognize the teachers that are here with them, Crystal Hill, Crystal, and Lindsay Moore.
Four. What about you, Miss Four. What grade are you in? She's third. What grade are you in? Fifth. Third. Four. Third. Y'all are really good. Yes, you are. Thank you. find out why it is an oversight. Uh, I came through uh, the Jeff Davis, uh, Jeff Davis and Hill Street. Uh, I saw a little girl, looked like she was um, kindergarten, and she was peeping through some cars trying to see how to cross the street on Jeff Davis, to go up Jeff Davis. There was not a patrol person there. There was a patrol person on Hill Street when you come off the interstate. I didn't understand that why we didn't have somebody out there. If you didn't have a patrol person, you should have had a teacher, or you should have had a janitor, or you should have had a parent, or you should have had somebody there to get those little kindergartners and others across the street at that elementary school. I proceeded up Jeff Davis. You had a patrol guard standing at the corner of Oak and Jeff Davis. You had a man standing in the middle in front of Lamp. Now Lamp is a senior high. Morris is an elementary. Tell me now, where should the patrol person have been? I have checked into it. And I'm, 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 I'm going to check into it further. Because I do not appreciate the fact, and the parents do not, they came and made me aware that they had gone to various areas down here at the Board of Education, that they had gone to the city council, that they had tried to get help in placing a patrol person out there on Jeff Davis. Now, these are our children. Please don't let me find that you're discriminating against our children down there at the Morris Elementary School. You got two patrol people up here at Lamb and one at Mars Elementary. Check into it because I will be checking into it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Rivers. Ms. Rivers. I think she, she was at the doctor with the child. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We have some gifts for everyone from our museum this summer. If you could just give them out quickly. And of course, it's the 50th anniversary of the Cecilia Montgomery Ball. I got everybody in but... I thought you were still here. Thank you so much. Um, glad to be here with you tonight. I have some very pressing issues that I want to discuss very briefly. I understand my time is limited. I'm from an organization called Saving Ourselves, a movement for justice and democracy. We have three of our, two of our members here, four, really some in the hall, Gus and Karen. And I'm here on a very important mission. Um, I'm also the founder of the National Voting Rights Museum in Selma and the Ancient Africa Civil War and Slavery Museum. And I uh, coordinate the annual bridge crossing jubilee every year like to invite all of you to the 50th next year. 
But as you know, there's not a lot to celebrate because the Voting Act, Act was uh, gutted by the Supreme Court. I'm really concerned, and I come here out of love, and the love for justice and the love for our children. Because next year is not just the 50th anniversary of the voting rights struggle, it's the 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War and the end of slavery. The 13th Amendment was passed December the 6th. It was last ratified December the 6th, 1865, 150 years ago. Um, that's why it pains me to drive our school named after Robert E. Lee and to see black and brown and white children standing under that statue. And I think they know so little about who Robert E. Lee is. And we all know that he's been glorified by many, but, but to the African child, who this man strongly believed in slavery, and he, uh, he, he claimed that, and I'm quoting from a book, that, that slavery was willed by God, and that it would only end when God ruled it. He is also known in the case to actually beat a woman by the name of Wesley Norris, because she escaped. And even though there are people that say he didn't beat her, clearly he supported the cruel institution of slavery. Jeff Davis also, not only was, did he believe in slavery, but he owned a hundred slaves. He owned our people. And it grieves me because the history of this is not taught in our schools. Not only that, the history of the wonderful things that African people did from ancient Africa, the builders of the pyramids. Our kids would not fear man if they know that the pyramids were built by black Africans. This is documented. And I, I'm here to ask this board not only to infuse African history into your school. We have one superintendent that has done that, the superintendent of Perry County. If you call on him, he will tell you the impact that it has on the children. The reason why I come before you is because I believe there is a direct connection between the violence, the, what happened in, uh, uh, what, what happened in Montgomery, the, the children killing each other, the, 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 the killings like Trayvon, the whole society devalues black children. It does, and they'll test. CNN did a test with the black doll and the white doll. You know, all the kids chose the white doll. And if you don't understand the impact of having to go into a school named after somebody that enslaved you, think of the Jews. Can you imagine a Jewish person naming any building after a Nazi? Can you imagine that any Jewish person on the, on the face of the earth would allow a child to go into a school named after any Nazi. I'm not talking about Hitler. I'm suggesting to you, when I went by your school, I saw children fighting the day I went by Robert E. Lee. And I, I, I know they can't articulate this devaluing, but just think about how you would feel if my white brothers and sisters, if, if someone would make your children go after Go to school named after someone named after ISIS or Al Qaeda. That's the impact that's having on us unconsciously. It grieves me. I bought a house over here. I may move over here. I'm not sure. I think I might. But it doesn't matter where I am. I, I, in Selma, when the city council, I fought hard to keep them from giving land to honor the first grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. He was a great general, but he was also a great extremist, a great white supremacist. And I'm begging you to think about the impact. Now, I know some of the people on that board are barely listening to me. I see some of you turning your way from me. But you would not be turning your head if a school was named after someone who killed white people, someone who enslaved and raped black women. I dare say you would turn away from me. I want you to give my children, who are also your children, because you represent all the children, the same love and respect that we expect our children to have. I just want to end with this. 200,000 black soldiers so fought in the Civil War. How many of our kids know that? 40,000 died. 6,000 were from Alabama. From Alabama. In Alabama, it was against the law to be free. If you were a free person, you could not live in Alabama. I'm suggesting this history is needed for our kids to stand on it to make them stronger. Please do not allow children to go to a school named after Jeff Davis, who committed treason, by the way. And um, Rowdy e. Lee, tell them about Elizabeth Bowser, a slave woman who went into the Confederate White House, I'm coming, Confederate, and spied 
to make sure that slavery would end the 105th anniversary. I know you're cutting me off, but let me tell you this. You cannot cut off the truth. Right. Eventually, these schools will be not named out the extremists who've done everything they could to devalue black children. When you, when you devalue people, they devalue each other. Okay. So I'm praying that y'all would do the right thing, put black history in your school, and remove these monuments of hate from public property. Thank you. Thank you. Due to me following protocol, I'll be reading a letter so I can be within the five minute time limit. I stand here before you a changed woman. Mind you, not so changed because I gave up the fight, but, but some enlightening mo moments have happened to me in the last 24 hours. If I were to put the last five days together, I would stand here and tell you that I have met with close to 40 teachers who truly are, as some of you claim, disgruntled. It was yesterday an employee I trust who is currently with NPS contacted me, and without knowing it, she probably gave me one of the most humbling moments in months, and pointed out the fact that some of the disgruntled had hung themselves. Moments later in that same day, less than 24 hours ago, a person from this Board of Education called me, and I'll call that a God moment, because if it had not been for Kevin Elkins, a local radio host who was lost yesterday in my neighborhood, I would not have changed this letter in any way. In fact, Mr. Elkins' loss of direction was somehow someone I feel God used to change my direction. After hanging up the phone, I found more common threads in this Board of Education member that sits before me now that called me yesterday than our differences. Now, don't get me wrong, we were both very matter-of-fact. But in that hour-long conversation, months of bitterness, I think, on both parts seemed to fade. In fact, her last comment to me after I said we will have times, I'm sure we will have to agree to disagree. She said, Lisa, I promise you, a year from now you will be right here with us and you will see a different light, and if we just agree 50% of the time, this will be great. The great changing scandal in Montgomery has gone on for two years. Certainly it looks like it has been settled, but in a recent article published this past month, the headlines read, MPS great changing scandal settled, but still a problem. There's a line in that article I'll quote you. Fortunately, one of the six is no longer employed by MPS and thus no longer in a position to harm students, at least not in this system. It is no secret that public opinion of the Montgomery Board of Education and current reputation it holds has diminished considerably as Montgomery was recently ranked in the polls as being the number two place in the nation that people are choosing to leave due to education and crime. My question and adjoining concern to the Board of Education is simple. Now that you have the documents to read and review, what are your plans to address these administrators who are still in our system? If your answer is one that the superintendent, Tommy Bice, answered this already, Bice does not deal with hiring, firing, or any personnel changes on a local level. For those that believe the remaining administrators that have yet to settle is a he said, she said issue, let me remind you of the facts. According to Tommy Bice, the great changing was systemic. One simply cannot negate the countless emails, tapes, and documents, nor does this negate the last day of school whereby it had been mandatory to stuff report cards and sort them by zip code for 26 years. The administration that was left behind knew full well why they wanted the teachers who would follow this procedure for the past 26 years at least to leave the premises. Unfortunately, the decisions these administrators made or allowed others under them to make warrant action from the Board of Education because the facts remain and are listed in the settlement documents. I've stated several times to the media and in political groups that have asked me to speak, we may have cut the head off the dragon here, but this dragon came with multiple heads and some of the king's horses and some of the king's men and women are still right here in the castle. I mentioned there was an adjoining concern why is it that those who stood up and did what was right and disclosed the truth 
were retaliated against by either forcing them to retire, by highly qualifying them to teach innocent children, to teach subjects they knew nothing about. I joined y'all in 61 days, and I'm looking forward to working with you. Thanks to each and every one of you, all of you, and your unanimous decision that has helped to make me who I am today, an advocate not only for the teachers and parents, but for our children who truly do want to earn an education. In closing, I challenge you today to step up and restore integrity to both the Board of Education and our city. According to Human Resources, it was stated right here at the Board of Education meeting just weeks ago, let's thank ourselves for bringing in the Teach for America teachers, yet you all can sit there knowing that one of those administrators in question has hired 25 teachers on a long-term basis to fill those now empty seats. I further challenge you today, members of the Montgomery Board of Education, to monitor those that have the power here to hire. I get it. When you all say a committee was formed to score exactly who would be hired, but when an administrator purposely, and I say purposely, requests their best friends and the classified human resource person to sit in on that committee that is a certified personnel issue, be a part of that committee, does that not skew the results? You better bet it does. Folks, that's called stacking the deck. If you call, can force innocent law-abiding teachers into retirement and not hire those with masters, EDSs, and obviously more qualified, why is that you are unable to do something about the proven guilty? Like Abigail Spence said in a, my favorite book, To Kill a Mockingbird, do your duty. The last lady had six minutes. The last lady had six minutes. Do your duty. This is your choice. I leave you with the following words from September two, 2014. Recovering lost public Dr. trust Key. is one of the most formidable tasks any organization can face. Dr. Key. In the case of a school system, academic integrity is a fundamental Thank element you, of trust. Dr. Key. When the individuals clearly guilty of misconduct remain in an organization, even diminish roles Dr. on a probationary Key. status, the task grows even harder. Thank you. Thank you, and I look forward to meeting with you. And I should have Thank had you, the same Dr. six Key. minutes that the last lady had. Thank, Thank you. you, Dr. Key. Mr. Taylor. I'm going to read as well so I make sure that I get everything out that I need to say. My children are diagnosed with quite a few health issues that impact their lives every day. It's called common variable immune deficiency, viral immune deficiency, and asthma. My children <clears throat> are forced to be uh, transferred, rezoned due to conditions not being conducive to our children's well-being. The schools in which they are zoned from are Flowers and Goodwin, and the schools in which they are rezoned to are Johnny Carr and Wilson. <clears throat> Even though we requested that they be transferred to Wilson and Blunt, which is next door to each other, due to transportation issues. We are forced to drive an hour to an hour and 15 minutes round trip in the morning, and then in the afternoon, it takes a total of an hour and a half. <clears throat> Our expenses for these trips equate to a total of $300 to $375 a month. What could you do with an extra $300 to $375 a month in your budget? Could you afford baseball? Could you look your kids in the eyes and say, no, I can't afford that right now because, you know, we can't afford it. $375 a month. What would you think? Where a major problem lies is that we've been told that there is no transportation assistance offered to students who receive zone variants. Yet students who choose to attend a magnet school in which they must test for and be accepted into receive transportation from their zoned school, let me restate, quote unquote, zoned school and back to the, well, to the magnet school and back to their zoned school. Keep in mind, there's a bus that leaves from behind our home at Flowers Elementary every morning that we've been denied three years in a row. Three years. We cannot ride, our kids cannot ride that same bus that goes to Chisholm, Morning View, Delrada, and Flowers Elementary 
and then to Johnny Carr, middle magnet. So how is that their zoned school? Or their magnet school? And back to their zoned school. It can't happen. You have elementary and middle school. Those don't add up. We've been denied over and over again by the leadership in the Montgomery Public School System this opportunity. Imagine <clears throat> for a moment looking your kids in the eyes and saying, we just can't afford it. We just can't afford it. I'll close with this Bible verse. Matthew 25, 45. He will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. I want to talk today about vacant schools in the west side of Montgomery, Alabama. The 23 years that God allowed me to be in this world, I never seen what I seen before when it comes to schools like Macmillan, McIntyre. Love is once again about to be vacant. Houston Hill. Schools like that. Four years ago, I, I fought very hard to keep McIntyre Middle School open. Because I went there, I was educated there, and I loved my school. And the superintendent then, and the same Board of Education, they reason for shutting McIntyre down was the heating system. Can you turn this mic down, please? <laughs> because the heating system, it because, hold my time and let them fix on the mic, please. Yeah. Well, I'm not yelling, I'm stepping back. <laughs> I'm past and I know about mics anyway. <laughs> I want them to turn the mic. There you go. There you go. So the, the reason for McIntyre was because the heating system was too much. And um and that was the reason why. So when they shut down McIntyre. Stop because they're playing games. And I think the mic is off. Well, as long as they can hear this, uh, that's all that matters. But uh, uh, th that was the reason why. So when they shut McIntyre down, uh, Sister Faye, um, the students that go to stay in Washington Park was zoned for Bellingham, the new building. And you had children under 15 years old walking from Washington Park to South Court Street because the Board of Education said we can't give transportation for them kids over there because they close enough to walk. Against state law. State law says but, but watch this. Two years ago, they sent a team inside of McIntyre to refurnish McIntyre put new winners on McIntyre, and then fix the heating system for MTEC. So it was good enough for MTEC, but it wasn't good enough for a middle school for black kids to be in. And now we're going to move Loveless in the city building where you got the mail down there, paid a little bit of money for them to go in the city. So now Loveless is about to be vacant once again. What have we done to our culture and our people on that side of town? You have vacant buildings there where they're going in there, busting out windows, stealing copper, and doing everything else. The reason why is because they don't care about the west side of Montgomery. 
Now, I went to Wells Fargo, and I got enough money and wouldn't have bet $50,000 today that any of these people in here, white people, would send their kid to McIntyre and they move lovers to McIntyre right now where Gills Village is located there. Well, you got 100% of people that stay out there is African American. That's not fair. That's not fair to us. The only middle school we got on there, South Lund and Bellingrad. The only elementary school, T.S. Morris and Martin Luther King Jr. Everything else is going towards East Montgomery. But I'll stop by to tell you something. Just because the giant is at the gate, <laughs> that didn't stop David for using a sack and three rocks. That's right. And now we got a new giant. But I got some rocks. And his name is Jesus. And I got a sack. And it is the word of God. And I'm going to use it every single day until magnetized reopen, until days of Lawrence is fixed. Until Mac Millen is fixed, until they put something decent in love and turn lights and win the problem. You know we did for our winners at home. We put energy efficient ones that cost a little bit over 800 some dollars. Turn lights in the school. These kids been in this school for so long, you parents ought to get mad. If my kids have been in school and it was term nights there, why they ain't called terminates? <laughs> why didn't they go to Fairview and get some rain and spray some rain or something in there? If termites been there all this time, we got to wake up educators, we got to wake up principals, and Board of Education, we got to wake up. Wake up. Now, you may not like what I'm saying. But I'm praying for you, Superintendent Martin Why? I'm praying for you because those that smile in your face mm -hmm. will turn around and vote you out of here and turn around and make your contract lower than what it is. And I'm going to tell you today, sister, don't forget where God brought you from. And don't forget where you came from. Just because you got some hundreds of thousands in the bank now, the God I serve, Thank you. he'll take it back from <laughs> Thank you. Now I want to respond. Hold on, hold on. I, I told I, I can't get a response. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I can't get a response. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Can I get a response? We don't respond. Why y'all don't respond? What's the next item on the agenda? Can y'all respond? I have some other people that want to speak. I, I, I brought up a legitimate concern that y'all can't but could, could all respond. Thank you, dear Mr. Brown. You, you my um. Uh, my board member, Ms. Brown, can you respond? Thank you, Mr. Brown. Bobby, I'll vote you back in, though. Thank you, Mr. Brown. There were some people that signed up to speak. Corner, Harris. Good afternoon. My concern is uh, the Connected Life Center, which is former Belling Rep uh, Community Center. A lot of you guys don't know exactly what goes on over there because you get a report. Uh, I haven't seen anybody over there from the board, but one person that's uh, Mr. Porterfield. And the reason why he came to drop off his Flyers to be realistic. Yes, my God. The reason I'm bringing this up is because our program has been uh, in existence for like a year and a half. And we've mentored kids and we are uh, taking the kids off the street. The marriage behind us, I mean, the marriage is uh, always on our uh, coattail about getting the kids off the street. But now we have a, a, a ordeal now that the kids are being put out of the center. We already addressed this one time before. Only thing we're asking for, we've been in a year and a half. we got all kind of programs going on. Only thing we're asking for is a fair shot. Uh, Y'all have a sealed bid going on now. 
why have a still be when we already have a proven record of what we're doing? Mm -hmm. We want you to a uh, this meeting is getting out of control. Uh, but, but I mean, we can't sit here and do this because just last month we told someone they could not speak because it was not an agenda item. And yet you are allowing him to speak. Now, it is not an agenda item. He, if he wanted to speak to this, he should have sent in. He's like, like a school, uh, uh, excuse me, ma'am, he's like a school uh, uh, vacant building. And now it's vacant. Those are not agenda items, Mr. Harris. Harris. But thank you for your concern. Wow. Ask them for the policy. I don't know what this is. Ask them to read the policy. I think you need to get security to get some of these folks out here that didn't come here for a meeting. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Well, God's going to hold us accountable. He's going to hold us accountable. This audio is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I have, when I call the set protocol, it's already established. I do, I want to speak on what is on the agenda. I want to make a correction. The three young men that you all recognize when they that found the baby, they were on their way to our center. They are part of our program. Mm, we right. teach them. I'm, I'm all right. That's yes, right. We teach them respect. <laughs> we teach them to respect themselves and to respect property, respect others. When they found the baby, we committed them for that. But the, the young people came to me and said, well, Bishop, they didn't recognize our center. I said, don't worry about that. The most important thing is that the child was saved. Okay? They were not going to Bellingrath Middle School. From my understanding, Bellingrath Middle School don't accept public in the gym. But we, they were coming to our gym, and, and we teach them that. We teach them black history as well. All right. Thank you for that. So that's what I want to say. I want to make that correction. And another thing is, as I'm getting ready to go to my seat, that we partner with MPS, whether y'all realize it or not, your food nutrition program. Over the summer, we was in partnership with you all. You all benefited from us. So I just want to just bring those things out. We are not enemies with MPS. We are your partners. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Jones. I want y'all to look at the face of the 16-year-old, her son, handcuffed and beaten at Lee High School last week. And now today, when she took him back, because we didn't have a due process here, the protocol was not followed. The decision was made by Ms. Summerlin to send him to alternative school. This is direct retaliation. Her autistic child, two years ago, beaten by a teacher, beat in the head with a lunchbox. Autistic. Now he's homeschooled. Why are her children being retaliated against the school system? Why isn't she getting grievance hearings and due process hearings? Ms. Why? Jones. Ms. Jones, no. Items that you wish to talk about. The item, give me another gentleman. Let me tell you where it is. Thank you. Uh, receive as information. We can't uh, Expulsion report. Specifics. Expulsion report. This needs to be known because you all won't listen. You all won't return the information. Mr. Durden, that's your district. Her child, her autistic child hit in the head with a lunch pail. He has PTSD. Her 16-year-old child handcuffed and beat. He had a concussion last week and had to go back to the emergency room. Mm. These are her black boys. Mm. And you all sit there. And you were a special ed, in special ed department, Superintendent Allen. And y'all won't respond. Vernetta, we've asked for the Freedom of Information Act to give us the video and all other information. Ms. Jones. You all are wrong. Ms. Jones. 
We are looking into this event. You, and we you are not going to discuss. You we're we're going to discuss this you with you. The unilateral Ms. Decision. Ms. We're going to discuss this with you. Discuss it with her. We're, we're, that's exactly right. Discuss she it is with her. Because you haven't will. been talking for four years. We, we'll talk with Madam her. Madam President, I move we'll for a point of order, please. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Jones, the parents. You, you, they will talk with you. I will talk with you, parents. I'm her advocate, and we speak together. Thank you. And your six minutes will They don't want to talk about beat kids handcuffed. They don't want to talk about that. Why can you just have a separate one? Okay. I, I just want to say, as superintendent of Montgomery Public Schools, regardless, regardless of what is fault about the way we feel about your children, please know that you are wrong with your thinking that we don't care. There are instances of situations that happen, and it takes time to go through and find out and research the details of this, and I'm talking to you, ma'am. It takes time to look at the details of what happens. It's easier when you come to us. It's easier when you come to us so that we can work these things out. We want to do that, and we will continue to do that. There are, in, there are situations right now in this school district where we are helping students who get into situations. Um, right here in this boardroom, we can't solve, you can't solve this problem on this level. Okay, but Ms. Uh, Allen, I have put out a grievance here since 2011. No one had anything about what happened to my child. My I child had a blow to the head, choke around the neck, stretches on his neck, and slap his head to be urine on himself. Got three different adults in the school system. Now they're telling me my 16 year old child because I've been filing for pipe. No one gave him a grievance here since 2011. I've been filing. Well, I don't know and about the 2011. I know about this situation. Yes, and I came and told you about 2011 when you came on the board this year. And I talked to you about that last school term in May when they tried to tell him and put a Put him out for something he didn't do last year. And I connected you to the school. And we'll talk. This is not the forum. I and promise you. Though, no this is not the forum. And I'm going through all stuff. We're, we're going to help you, you the way we have all children. I promise you that. But this is not the forum. I don't want the atmosphere in this room to be such that anyone would think that our efforts are selfish or uncaring because they truly are not. Uh, I'm sorry that you feel that way and we'll work, we'll work, we'll work with you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. We're going to, we're going to work with you. We will work with you. Thank you. Okay. Let's move on. The next item on the agenda, receive for information with the lover. She said, this is out, this is not real. This is what we do in Montgomery, all black city. Put me on the program for the fifth down the road. And I'll tell you Madam Chair, where. members of the board, you should have received a financial report of your packet of information. This is the report for the month of August 2014. It's the 11th month of the fiscal year. You'll see on the cover page, lines one and two, total assets and other debits and total liabilities and fund equity for $18,601,181.45. Line three, the unreserved fund balance was $10,140,600.15. And the total fund equity was $18,535,398.37. On line five, we begin the fund balance last October uh, 1st, in the beginning of the fiscal year, was $17,436,870.62. Thus far, year to date, total revenues and other fund sources are $200,525,168.29. 
total expenditures and other fund usage here today $199,426,640.54. So thus far this year, revenues have still exceeding expenditures by $1,098,527.75. It leaves an ending fund balance on August 31st, 2014 of $18,535,398.37. The same figures on line 40, including the record for the balance. I'll point to you uh, line 3, the underscore fund balance of $10.1 million. That figure will go down this next month, which will be the end of the fiscal year. We'll get that report sometime uh, in October as we get closed out of the system. Uh, with that, I'd like to answer any questions you might have. Are there questions for Mr. Glover? Thank you. It's not. Mr. Glover, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Glover. Can we close the door? Angela, do you mind closing the door? Secure that door. Madam President, it's really hard to hear that. That noise out. We're gonna close the door. Crack the door. Good evening. Good morning, and I would like to thank you all for the opportunity to stand before you to talk about our central support teams that we have here. The purpose of our uh, social support team is to provide targeted leadership, instructional, and operational support. Uh, we realize that all of our schools, that they serve our students and they serve different communities. Therefore, we are so proud of the fact that we have our central support teams that are able to offer customized support to all of our principals. Our principals, they have the opportunity to talk about the various needs of their schools, and we have a central support team that's large enough to provide that individualized support. As you can see here, our central support teams are broken down uh, into two feeder patterns. Feeder pattern one that also consists of non-feeder pattern schools, and feeder pattern two, which consists of non-traditional feeder pattern schools. Realizing both that uh, Ms. Lauren and I, that we have the opportunity to lead both teams, and you can see right here that our teams are large enough that we're able to provide that customized support. Uh, we are so thrilled that we have the opportunity to uh, pull team members from each department uh, so that when needs arise at our schools, that we're able to dispatch uh, support right then and there. Our feeder patterns are broken down again into two patterns. You can see here that feeder pattern one uh, serves your non-traditional schools and of course the schools that feed into our three high schools. Starting with the elementary schools, those schools feed into those five middle schools and those five middle schools they feed into the three high schools. Feeder pattern two uh, serves the non-traditional schools slash elementary <coughs> schools and they feed into two high schools. We have the elementary schools that feed into those four middle schools and those four middle schools that feed into the two high schools. Our, all of our principals were informed about our central support teams during the summer. Uh, our principals were, and they were informed that we have a team that would be able to come into the schools and listen to the areas of need from all of our schools and provide that customized support. Uh, the, uh, the functionality of our CST teams, they consist of the following. Uh, that we had meetings with our principals back in August, uh, the first week after school started. And so all of our principals, they received an email with the following agenda. Uh, that we have the opportunity to go in and we talk about the role of the central support teams. Uh, we introduce the CST team members and we're able to assign various responsibilities to each of our team members. Then the principals, they have the opportunity to talk about the needs of their schools. Uh, the principals, they stand up and they tell us about their vision and their mission. They talk about the demographics of their schools. They talk about their leadership teams and how they function. They talk about the ACIP status and the progress. They explain to us about how they use data to drive instruction. They also uh, talk about how they support the various needs and levels at their schools through, their, through tier support. They talk about their areas of success and the areas that they feel as though that they need improvement. 
once that is well, once the principals have the opportunity to finish, then we go into an open discussion where the principals have the opportunity to talk about exactly what they need for their schools. And at that table, we're actually able to provide that support right then and there. So the next slide actually shows uh, a picture of these meetings uh, taking place. The first picture shows uh, Floyd Elementary School, so when the team went in and we had the opportunity to listen to Mr. Barry as he explained uh, the successes of his schools and the areas that he felt as though he needed support. The second uh, picture there shows us going, to, going into Bellingraph Middle School and also listening to the areas of, areas of needs and also offering uh, support. So again, our CST team, uh, our CST team consists of about 10 to, five, 10 to 15 members that represents the, the various departments of the uh, central office. Again, we go in and we talk about the vision and mission and goals of the school. We talk about the demographics and the, and the accomplishments that they have made. We talk about their data. We talk about their tier support. But most importantly, we talk about how we can support those schools. And so uh, Ms. Ray Lauren is going to talk about uh, that area, about our areas of support. Good evening. Um, just to show you a little bit about how we follow up after a central support team meeting we have um, different roles during the meeting so we do have a recorder at each meeting and they take notes very detailed notes and we um, put the notes in a recorder form and then we share not only do I share with my team but you know, Dr. Bird's team also looks at the notes because the, the people that make up the two central support teams they kind of offer support crossing over based on areas of needs for each individual school. So we do have the reporter tool which talks about areas of progress, areas of focus, um, how tiered instruction is structured in that school to serve those students and their individual needs. It also, if you'll go to the next slide, um, we do sort of by the end of the conversation with our central support team meetings with our schools, we have um, identified some areas of need and um, some areas of success and then we go on to what will the work be? What can we do to support you? And I'm really excited about it because we, we go to each school, talk to the principal and their leadership team and then look at what they need. So we're not just painting one, uh, using one paintbrush to paint the whole district. We are actually tailoring the support to the individual needs of the school to, so that we can help the children. So this is one uh, tool that we use. If we go to the next slide. Um, this is a follow-up. So not only are we recording everything, but we have assigned work based on the information we get at each central support team meeting and that work is designated to a specific person at the central level. And then um, we put that in a scope of work. This is one example of a scope of work coming out of a meeting and basically it's that to-do list. And then we have that last column, the progress notes, where people will go in and if it's my responsibility to do something on that list, once I follow up and I complete a task or I work with the principal or I work with the staff there in the school, I'll go into this reporting tool and say this is what happened. So we have at our fingertips looking at um, the requested support, what we did to follow up with that and what's next. And then the next slide shows a slightly different view. Um, Dr. Bird and I, uh, we work great together by the way, so I'm glad you hired him. <laughs> but we, uh, we, have a, we have a great little small team right here in, in this building in instructional support. But we uh, decided to try out two different methods of collecting this information on progress. And we have one look at it where it's in a spreadsheet where all the schools are there, all the needs, and then we go in and type on that. And then we have one where it's a table on a Word document. We're kind of testing out both, see what works best for our team members, what's the easiest to use. And then we'll um, kind of consolidate and use the best one as we learn a few things. But what you will see is that you, you have um, a task, who's going to be, you know, what category it's in, who's designated as the contact person, and then what happens in follow-up. So these are just some of the examples. And because we wanted everybody to have access to putting information and sharing it, we're using shared documents, we're using a Dropbox file, so that all the people on both teams have access to the files. So um, let's say that the math specialist is on his team, secondary math specialist. 
but I have a school who has a secondary math concern. So she can see both files so that she can go and say, oh, here's my task, my list of work. These are the priorities that I need to focus on. And so our specialists and all the other central staff, they're going and looking at the needs, and they have been working so very hard. They've been in the schools, they've been working with teachers, uh, professional development, observing classrooms, giving feedback, modeling. Uh, we also have operational tasks that have been asked for, and Mr. Dotson and his department have been very responsive to the needs of the school. So, and in all departments, because like Dr. Bird said, every department has been represented. If we go to the next slide, you back up just one. Um, just to show you the documents like agendas for meetings, uh, the notes for each school once we do that. This is shared on the internal um, network, on our intranet, and we do have on the documents page central support team, and then every school is listed, and then if we go to the next page, once you open a folder, this is what it looks like. And so for ease of showing you, I just wanted to give you some snapshots, but uh, once you open up, there are all these folders. Um, Dr. Blair, uh, Ms. Allen, they love to go in and look at the progress because they don't have to wait for a meeting. They can go in and look and see what is going on with these schools um, and find progress and then areas of support. And then the next slide. Um, some of our schools, based on the tiered support that we are offering our schools, and I think Dr. Blair explained this earlier in the year, that some schools receiving tier three support they actually have an interposition partner, and that interposition partner spends one full day a week from intake of children to going through the whole day, classrooms, lunch, and then dismissal. And they collect information, they observe classrooms, they're there to work with the leadership in that school um, in areas of need and support. And then um, also it just helps, in, helps with the central staff in keeping a handle on all the the data that we need to monitor and look at. If schools are not tier three and they don't have an interposition partner, they have been signed a data monitor. And that person goes in the school and pulls some information, but most of it can be pulled you know, through the computer. And there are reports, interposition partner reports and data monitor reports. If we can go to the next slide. This is an example of an interposition report that they would fill out once a week. This one's very detailed. Sometimes they wouldn't have all of that information on there. But um, they are looking for things and making observations and reporting this information about operational things, instructional things, and then just other things that they may see. Um, so this information, again, is a quick way for us to look and see, you know, just some notes for what went on in the school this week. And then these tools, and if you go to the next slide, this is a data monitoring, which is similar, but just not quite the detail as the interposition tool. And so we use these, these documents with all this information to help in the next meeting, or if we have contact with the leadership team at the school in between, because we have data, we have information to base the support that's needed, and we, it helps us guide and direct what's going on in the school to help the children. And then the next and um, last slide that we have talking about the follow-up meetings. Dr. Bird mentioned that our initial CST meetings were all in August. We basically finished like the first week in September. We ran over just a little bit. But those were the initial meetings. So we met with every school. And we had those meetings to talk about where are you, what are your successes, what are your areas of need, and what can we do to support you. Now, starting, I think we started last week, uh, we're in round two of meetings, and so tier one schools get meetings um, every quarter. So we meet with them less often, but when needs arise, when, if a need arises, they will call us and we will work with them. Tier two, every other month, they have formal meetings, and then tier three, we meet monthly. And so we're bringing all this information together that we got, that we've uh, collected, and we talk about that, we look at data at every meeting, um, and we're very specific at the first one. We did not have our Aspire data. We have that now. The schools have that. So on these follow-up meetings, that's under the data card, what we're looking at. And all of this always leads to what's next. Central staff, how can you support me? And so we hope we're building a relationship, and I really think that we are with our school, that the central staff is here. You know, we're here for support. We're not here for gotcha. But there is a monitoring piece, and it's all tied into this.
but the monitoring leads to support. And so we're very excited about it and hope you enjoyed the update on CST. Questions to the Ms. Breyer? Uh, yes, I, I hear what you're saying and all of that sounds good and I'm excited about that. But how does this play in? How is it co correlating with the 36 to 90 day plan? I'd not like somebody explain it. Oh, and I did kind of, I missed one little step, talking about the ACIP, it was on the yes, slide and I just yes. forgot to mention that. Uh, we also have a designee on each team that is working with the school on the ACIP, the Continuous Improvement Plan, and our schools have had their visits, I mean their closeout meetings basically on 306090, and any of those things that were not complete on the 306090 day action steps, they, roll, they are rolling into the ACIP, and part of what we're doing as central support team is to make sure that they make it into the ACIP and that we have that continued work. For uh, several of the schools, there were things that they worked on and technically they completed the steps, but they know that they're very important items to continue to work on, so they are definitely in the ACIP. So in other words, you do have a paper trail. Yes, ma'am. And we, have, we are continuing that. It didn't just go away. It is rolling into this continuous process, and then the central teams are involved in that. Mr. Dean? Um, I don't know if it would be market or y'all to answer this. What kind of feedback are y'all getting from the, the schools? Are they finding this helpful? Uh, are they excited about it? Are they embracing it? Yes, sir. Uh, the schools are, are very excited, uh, and we've had some feedback from them. But they are very excited that for the first time in a long time, that when they ask for something, that they actually know that they are going to get it. Uh, and so we have received some positive feedback from them uh, because we make sure that if it's placed in the notes uh, as an area of support, we make sure that we monitor the team members that we have on our teams to make sure that they are uh, that they are answering that support, that they are providing the support that they need. So we have that accountability piece to make sure that our central support teams, the members on our teams, we, we have that support system and that accountability piece to make sure that they are doing exactly what we said that we would do. And I think that it's also wonderful that for kind of the first time since I've been here in the central level that we have in writing all the wonderful things that instructional support and other central office departments, all the wonderful things that they do. And it's there because they're, you know, they're putting in there what they're doing and how to support. That's nice to hear. Mr. Porterfield? Yeah. I'm listening and my understanding you go out here. First, you identify, gather data, get, gather your data, analyze, organize the data. And my concern, though, after you have identified those areas of concern, how often do you uh, review the progress with respect to those items or those things that have been identified to make sure that they're doing or you're meeting the needs of these uh, schools in terms of those things that they're presented to you or what you have <coughs> found to be uh, areas of concern? Well, we, we, we do meet monthly with our tier three schools, so that is a formal meeting, but in between we are communicating with uh, the principals on progress, and if they're tier three, they do have an interposition partner. That's once a week, um, you know, looking at progress, you know, things that we talked about at the first monthly meeting, how is that going, what things are in place, is it moving forward? So it is being looked at um, on a regular scheduled basis. And also the interposition uh, person, but make sure what, and they have the task of making sure what, that they are in that school <coughs> at least once each week. And they have to submit that documentation to us for, uh, so that we can see exactly what's going on in that school. And they are also tasked with making sure that those things that we said that we were going to provide for them, that interposition partner would and make sure that we're actually doing those things. And so we're very transparent with it. So the principals also receive that same progress monitoring document. And so they see exactly what, what we say that we are doing. And so if we are not doing it, then they can call us up on it and make sure that we are doing it. So it's very transparent and make sure that everybody understands what we're doing. Yeah, I was just making sure we had check and balances with respect to those things that have been identified and make sure that is carried through, yes, you know, and have some way of, uh, you know, looking into that. Yes, sir. Are there other questions from the board? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good Great job. job.
Salter. Good evening. We all know how important parental involvement is, not only to success in school, but to success of our of our children. Last year, we ended the school year with seven schools that did not have PTAs. And I'm pleased to tell you today that all of our schools have active PTAs and uh, they're going strong and, and doing well. We are working very hard to bring parental involvement into our schools. We've been looking for a, a campaign to bring to Montgomery to help parents um, and schools come together to become more partners. And we found one. We've been looking, we found a successful campaign that's been around for a little while and has worked very well in lots of different systems. It's called Be There. And so beginning with the coming week, we are going to be embarking on this Be There campaign. It's designed as a two-year campaign, but you can revisit it as often as, as you'd like. And it's been successful in many, many, um, many, many school systems. Be There encourages parents to be more involved in their children's lives, not just in education, but in their lives in general. It encourages parents to embrace their role as their child's first teacher and often best teacher. It provides educational opportunities to parents so they can learn how to work more care closely with schools and also to help their kids with things like homework. I would just die if I had to help some kid with a physics class or something. It just I, I, I need some help with that, certainly. And it also encourages parents to turn ordinary moments into extraordinary moments. We're going to be promoting the messages of the Be There campaign using several communication tools, including Lamar Advertising. Lamar Advertising is donating 10 billboards, a space of 10 billboards for us, and we're going to continue to work with them throughout this year and, and next year and beyond. And this is the very first billboard that you'll see going up over the next few days. And it will be something that uh, uh, will get more than 200,000 impressions over the course of a month. And so we're very excited about that. There are other billboards as well, but this will be the, the very first one. We're also working with iHeartMedia. That used to be known as uh, Clear Channel Radio. And iHeartMedia is going to be running PSAs for us at no cost. Uh, and so we'll be getting the message out through those radio stations, Hallelujah and uh, Hot 105.7. The Montgomery Advertiser has agreed to do uh, stories for us about uh, what it means to be more involved in your child's life. And the first one will be in tomorrow morning's paper, and it will talk about the program in, in general. Uh, I'm working on them to try to get some ad space. <laughs> Stay tuned for that. Get them now. We're working with AUM. AUM is going to help us with a parent university of sorts. Uh, the, we're talking about the workshops uh, that help kids with their homework, how to uh, get scholarships for your child, uh, and even things such as uh, planning a family budget. If you help families do better, then we help our kids do better and to be more involved in our parents as, uh, with our parents as well. We also have a series of posters, and here are three of them. Here they come that will be uh, produced and placed in various places around town, including our school, of course, public library. We've already, already talked with the city. They'll be in the libraries. They'll also be in um, uh, parks and recreation offices. And we're also doing something a little different. We've been calling around and have gotten some doctors to commit to put these posters in the doctor's offices. A couple of them have agreed to put it in all of their exam rooms. And we're starting out with pediatricians and obstetricians, and we're also going to be talking to, uh, we're working right now on pediatric dentists. So we're looking for places where parents and children come together so they can, they can see the message of, of Be There. Uh, we have flyers that will be going into the schools and also into various retail outlets. My goal, and I, I actually did this when I was in Mobile, is to find a, a couple of grocery stores where we can go and put the flyers in the bags as they check out. 
so they can get the information. We get it to as many, as many people as possible. And then we have some TV PSAs that WSFA is going to work with us on. And now this is a generic version of it, but we're going to customize three different PSAs. This is, this is one of them. <coughs> Blah, blah, blah. I gotta stop at the bank. Like I care. I decided my favorite song. And then he said, wanna learn how an ATM works? So I did. I learned a little about banking. That was cool. Thanks, Dad. <coughs> That's aimed at middle school kids. We also have an elementary kid, um, uh, one with an elementary kid, and then one that has parents interacting with their children during the PSA, and uh, Montgomery Public Schools will be a uh, part of that. We're doing some, whoops, I don't see it again, do we? We also are doing um, a series of focus groups. We're doing focus groups, the first group is this Friday of parents, and we're going to try to use that as a baseline. We find out where we are. After we've done the campaign for a few months, then we'll come back and talk to parents again and see, measure how, uh, what kind of difference that the campaign has made and make adjustments if we need to as, as we go along. We think it's an exciting campaign. It's going to be good for parents and good for the school system. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. Um, Ms. Brian? I think this is wonderful and we can get more parents involved and then the public know we're selling our own story. Yes. And to give you an example of how things are received, now uh, the advertiser left when this was going on. Right. But the, the sellout for the paper, this does not sell papers, you know? No. So tomorrow it would be the blowout at the board meeting instead of the good things that you're trying to do for parents and students. And that's, that's really sad. I tried to get him to say. <laughs> <laughs> but that, you don't say a paper that way. Yes, ma'am, I know. Thank you. Mr. Porterfield. Thank you. Uh, well, um, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, certainly, it's a good thing to tell our story so that we can hopefully change the public's negative perception of public education. My question here, though, and you mentioned those 10, um, those 10 um, billboards by the mark. Yes. Are we speaking of the same 10 uh, billboards that were, let's say, back July 2013? No, sir. It's a, it's well, a different group. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, the, the, my concern is that the, the billboards were to be at Atlanta Highway, Taylor Road, Mount Meigs Road, Cartier Road, West South Boulevard. I hadn't seen one yet at West South Boulevard or Day Street. I don't know. When are they on? Well, they're not, they're not, not up yet. They will be. I hope that, that what we're venturing into now won't take as long as from July 22nd, uh, 2013 to no, be that, out there and showing the public what we're doing. That was a different group. Yes. That was a different this group. is a different group of billboards. And what they did, you know, first of all, since they're donating the space, we can't pick the, the best ones. They've been very generous and they, we have um, uh, some that are on the boulevard. Uh, we have some that are around Maxwell. Um, I can't remember them all off the top of my head. Well, I can initially, I have them at Atlanta Highway, Hill <coughs> Road, Highway. Carter Hill Road, Gee Road, and Decatur Street, Lower Tonka Road, South Decatur Street, and McGee. I mean, I mentioned the McGee already. Well, that makes you feel better. I've seen oh. them at Taylor Road. I haven't seen them on the West Boulevard as well. Well, I'm just trying to tell you there. Well, well, well here's, here's what I, what I did, uh, Mr. Portfield. I looked for two different things. I looked at spreading them out as much as they could among the ones they offered us, spreading them out, and also looking for the ones that had the highest number of exposures. We're, even though we're getting them for free, we still want to get the most bang for our buck, if you will. So I'll be glad to send you the new list, um, and, and hopefully they'll be up within the next four or five days. Okay. Um, there was one by um, Max Blair for Space. Is it, you already, it was already up? Yeah, got two. Oh, no, not that. Oh, okay. The oh, other. You know, oh, yes. What, what I was concerned with is ones here where you've got the, um, the uh, it was here on the West South Boulevard as well as one I believe mentioned somewhere around uh, Normandale and 
that area on the boulevard, but I hadn't seen any out there. Okay, one. those are those the from last year or are they that was for that should have been um, around July uh, 2013. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, that, those those that's a different list. We had to start over again. It's not the same group, but but I, I did my best to spread them out and also to get as much exposure as we could. I'll, I'll be glad to send you that list first thing in the morning. Mr. Yes, you give me some of the flyers, I'll take them out. Okay, great, great. Okay, we're, everything's in the process right now being printed. We're ready to go. Mr. Dean. Uh, Tom, I, I don't think we've done this uh, system-wide, but I think it would be a good addition to this program. Uh, the park crossing opened up. Rocky, uh, uh, I gave him what we call a success contract mm -hmm. that uh, laid out the expectations for parents as well as the children, the students, mm -hmm. and they both signed the contract. Mm -hmm. And Rocky can, when he gets up, I'd like for him to address how successful he thinks it is. Uh, but I think it would be great because, I mean, you're trying to get parents involved in it. And whenever you put it in front of them and lay out the expectations at the beginning of the year, this is what we expect from the students, and this is what we, the involvement we, and one of the things was being involved in the PTA. Right. I'm so glad that you've got a PTA in every single school. That's really, really important. So I'd like to, Mark, Margaret, I don't think we have it in every school, the success contract, but I think it would make me a great addition to this. Well, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Were there other comments from the board? Good job. Thank you, Mr. Salter. Thank Salter. you, Mr. Salter. Mrs. Sykes. I think I can still stand. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had, I'm sorry you're the last of the night. I'm just glad to not be the total last of the night. We're well, trying to make this quick, but also I hope productive and informative. It takes a community, and it takes a community of passion and commitment to meet the needs of the 31,000 students that we all wake up and go to bed every night thinking about. And that passion is really important. But it can't be just the work that you do. We say all the time you have to be accountable to our students and to our community for results. With the Montgomery F Foundation, we also are committed that it's also, not only paying attention to that accountability, but it's also paying attention to the community and our accountability back to you as a school system. Looking for ways that we partner, looking for ways that we can make a difference, looking for meaningful, ways that we can make long-term changes for those 31,000 students. So we've spent, as we usually do, a number of years researching, thinking about, and visiting best practices around the country around the subject of summer learning loss. And last year we started our first pilot. Now I'd like to give you a quick video here, and it's very quick, that helps set the stage for you. Let's look at two children one from a middle-income family, the other from one of the millions of low-income American families. As the two kids head off to kindergarten, look what happens. The middle-income child starts out with a six-month lead. The low-income child is already falling behind because of a lack of access to early reading and preschool education. During their year in kindergarten, in the same school and classroom, the two children will learn at about the same rate, so we'll move them both forward nine months. But look what happens in that first summer between kindergarten and first grade. Our middle-income child moves ahead about a month in reading because learning of one kind or another continues over the summer. The low-income child falls back about two months so when school begins again, when they go back for first grade, the gap between them has already widened. During first grade, again, they move ahead at about the same rate, another nine months. That next summer, the activities and lifestyle of the middle-income family keep that child moving forward, but the low-income child has fewer opportunities to reinforce good habits like reading, and that child falls farther behind. Then we come to second grade, and again, our two children learn at the same rate. But the summer after second grade sets our low-income child back again, and our middle-income child moves forward again, and the gap widens again. By just the third grade, the two children are already far apart. By the end of fifth grade, the gap between the children is two and a half to three years. 
It will keep growing through middle school. So you see, without addressing what's happening during the summer, it is impossible to ever catch up. It's impossible to close the gap. No matter how much high quality learning goes on from September to June, every year the gap widens. Pretty startling and gets your attention. We have a system of a poverty rate of around 74%. We can't afford not to pay attention to the research and the conversation nationally around this issue of summer learning loss. Just like pre-K, it matters what we do getting them ready for school, and the school system has been paying attention to that. It also matters what happens in the summer. So based on these issues, we piloted last summer our first program to address summer learning loss. It was around fourth graders. And it's everything except what the normal school year is. It's not built around worksheets, sit down in a tr uh, static traditional desk, and don't move. Not that traditional school is like that all day, but it's much more of a hands-on, student-led, as well as teacher-facilitated learning environment. So this year was our second year. And the partnerships, which were invaluable, and again, when I talk about community coming together, you see the depth of the partnerships. This is about working with the school system and bringing other supports and getting other investment and bringing people along with this issue. I especially want to highlight the Kiwanis Foundation. Please go to the fair. It is the benefits from that fair that funds great projects like this and other things that are important in our community. So we did five full weeks, five days a week, morning program, and we started with one of the components that's critical for summer learning, which is nutrition. Every child got breakfast, and every child got lunch and a snack. The lunch was through the summer feeding program through the Y, which I know is part of the larger program. Mornings for academics. The successful program and the high quality program focuses on improving reading and math. That's where the loss is. We also, a high quality program has to have the cultural enrichment and also physical activity involved. So Fridays were leading to learn days and we went to many different places. We utilized, we, we served rising fourth, fifth, and sixth grade students. Those are pivot points coming out of third grade important time, have we captured what we need to have captured as we make that transition in reading to learn as opposed to learning to read. Fifth and sixth grade transition starting to the middle school, we know the importance there. We did not use a traditional curriculum, we used novels as the core of the study. So each class read a novel, fourth graders read Hatchet and How to Eat Pride Worms, which generates lots of interest, and we interweave math through those novels. So they get deep rich um, time around studying a novel, understanding a novel, thinking about characters, thinking about cause and effect, really delving into um, deep study. But they're also adding math to it. So they did graphs, for example, our fourth graders did a tremendous amount of graphs about how often they've gone uh, camping, or if you went on a camping trip, um, would you eat a worm, you know? They did surveys, they graphed the results. Every day they were graphing and charting those things. Our fifth and sixth graders read two novels. One was Wonder and the other was um, Out of My Mind, two award-winning um, young adult fiction books. And what was interesting is coincidental. Wonder is about a child who is, has a, a facial deformity, I believe it's a cleft palate, and what it's like to be different. The Out of My Mind is about a child who has cerebral palsy and is totally unable to speak, and so has to totally communicate through a talking board but kept being put in a classroom with children that had more challenging um, uh, learning difficulties. And this child was actually um, very bright, but couldn't express and share her knowledge. So our fifth and sixth graders spent the summer really thinking about what it's like to be different, what it's like to be challenged. The ones that read um, What Out of My Mind actually formed, they had to create a talking board that they could put anything they wanted on it. But for an hour that day, they couldn't speak. They could only use the talking board. So when you talk about children starting to understand differences and compassion, that wasn't on our data sheet and it wasn't on our checklist for being able to chart. But when they did PSAs with iMovies at the end, and I had children actually talking about my differences, I stuttered. And they felt comfortable and safe enough and had been in an environment where they actually shared those kinds of issues. It was really rewarding. But even more so, what was important to see is our goal which was, did we stop the summer learning loss? To do that, our, each staff had, each site had um, a site manager, an instructional leader, 11 certified teachers, and 11 classroom assistants. Very quickly, our 11 teachers 
predominantly most of them were from MPS, some were not. Um, we had 11 classroom assistants and most of those were students at Alabama or Troy or I think um, Auburn was three schools that fed in the most um, that were interested in or in education programs. These are our rising educational leaders. What a great experience for them for the summer. They participate through VISTA. So 87, I'm sorry, 89 percent of the children are low income. And let me tell you, the registration is first come, first serve. There's no screening, there's no fee, and no charge. 89% of our children are low income. We had a total of 168 children in the program that broke down, as you see. We had children from magnet schools and traditional schools. There was a really rich mix of students. And they came from 36 different schools throughout the system. Um, that's a pretty broad mix of all the elementary schools feeding into the program, which we were very pleased about. Changes from last year to this year, we keep learning every year. Just so you know, we added two more grades this year, over last year. We didn't intend to do it, but I want to applaud the city and city parts and recreation program that really wanted to grow and wanted to enrich the wonderful program they had up at Carver. The one to have something they can actually measure and make sure they were making a difference in the investment of the money. So that's what this program does, is allow us to determine, did we make a difference? Did we give a good return on investment? Did we impact children? One of the things that was important this year is trying to put in more professional development time, and we did a little bit of that. We're going to increase that next year, as you'll see. We had the classroom assistant program. The teachers got at least an hour to almost an hour and a half every day for planning time together. That's like winning the lottery when you're a teacher. Um, we used the assessment tool, Global Scholar, which is a system that y'all know y'all are using, to do a pretest and a post test. And we also added more surveys for parents, students, and staff this year to get even more feedback. Three hours of math reading, student academic ratio is about 15 to 2, that's the teacher and the assistant. And we're pretty committed to that. Our classrooms need to be between 15 and 18 for this program for a five-week impact. We built it around identified challenges and weaknesses that our children came with. We didn't assume before we had the children that we knew exactly what we need to teach them. We used the pretest, we used the structure of the novel to then add in where they needed special focus. So graphing last year and this year for fourth graders is an area that um, they were showing up week on when we did the assessment, so that was the focus area. Cause and effect for our fifth or our sixth graders was one an area that they really worked hard on. Um, so we really used that data to drive how we moved through um, the, the summer curriculum. Afternoon enrichment is important. The Nixon group, they went to um, the Y, Parks and Recreation, or the Boys and Girls Club, <coughs> they done every afternoon once they had lunch. So the morning was academic, the afternoon was enrichment activities. Carver, they stayed on site and went right over to Parks and Recreation Program to live on site. So that was a really, we learned that that worked very well and was very, very helpful and we hope to do more like that. I told you about leaving to learn on Fridays. History does matter, it matters deeply, and we were lucky to have a focus that was helpful, I think, this summer. We did the historic riverfront. We had architects that talked to the kids to understand about the construction of our city. We went to the SPLC, our planetarium, which is amazing. The Museum of Fine Arts, the Department of Archives, which was great, and um, we did go to the Arboretum too, which is just a wonderful place to go. They got to use worms, not eat them. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, that's probably the biggest thing. They love figuring out who takes the, room, the worms. We had community partners like Eat South and Thematic and others who came and talked things like Linear Perspective and artists who did that. Music and rhythm, poetry, rocket launches. East South is a wonderful partner in the gardens. We taught geometry out in the garden. Those are the lessons the kids uh, really listen to and learn and remember. We also had an extra this year with Starbase, and I'm not going to talk about Starbase a lot. There will be another report, but y'all will all get an invitation, which is our STEM program out at Maxwell. So we had a six-week where we were able to take 28 of the sixth graders to spend another five days with hands-on STEM programming. That, too, was tested on content as they went in and we had a testing that increased about 36% their knowledge of the, the components that were taught. So what were the results? Okay. I always say that is really important, and you don't just share the prettiest. You share it all, and you think about it deeply, and you talk about it. We had 68% attendance. Not happy with that. But we also kind of know why. We had some recruiting going on for some football programs, accidental, or basketball programs that happened that took some kids out for a full week. We know how to fix that. That's what pilots are about. But on average, the big thing that matters, we had no loss. Remember our goal? Zero loss. 
No loss in reading or math on average. That's huge. It's hard. I tell you, our teachers, and one of our teachers is here, um, I think at the beginning they were like only five weeks and we're going to get gains and we're going to, you know. At the end, I remember after two weeks, they were like, we've only got three weeks left and we're getting ready to take a break for the 4th of July. At the end, I think everybody kind of looked around and went, wow, what a difference five weeks can make. It really can. So in reading, 66% of, of students actually made gains, and in math, 65%. I'm not going to go through the standard item pool score. Y'all get to spend a lot of time on that, but we had um, growth of 4 and 2% in those areas, which is you know, a four or five week program. It's bringing them up to their content level. This one, though, is important, and I'll finish with um, the at-risk quartile. We had, these are the students that rank, um, that are below the 25th, 25th percentile, what you designate at risk, and it's a real red flag, literally put in red on your reports. Moving them to another quartile during the pro uh, program represents a significant accomplishment. So we wanted to decrease that at risk. And in reading, we went from 58% of those students at risk to 49%, 9% reduction in five weeks. In math, it was a 16% reduction. 64% of students were at risk based on Global Scholar. So every little bit makes a difference. And it makes a lot of difference. Looking forward, we want to stabilize next year the third year of the pilot with the fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Grow it. Focus on professional development and staff development. Not only for the staff, but also for other teachers. And we're already talking with Dr. Blair and thinking about, is there a PD component? Is this a laboratory opportunity? We can serve our children, which we want to do, but if we can also provide our, our teachers with what they want and need in opportunities of professional development with their peers, we've affected hundreds of students. So we really want to look at that. And we want to be able to follow our students over time. We need to know how much of a difference is this making when they go back in the fall, at the end of this year, with this cohort um, performing higher than the cohort maybe that didn't have summer engagement. Those will help both us and you and all of us in the community make stronger decisions and investment for the things that work. And we only want to invest in things that work. So this coming year, we also are looking at new programs. Like I said, Starbase, we hope to maybe expand. It could be part of the whole summer. Lemonade Day, an entrepreneurial program that we could run one whole segment around where they actually learn money management and lemonade business making. The sky's the limit. We want to hold this pilot in partnership with you. We appreciate and cannot tell you enough how much the facilities matter. The buses that y'all invested to help bring kids from one of the sites to um, next and every day and then for our field trips every Friday. But that was y'all's partnership and you saw the rest of the partnership. It was rich and deep and that's the community standing up. So I have questions? I, I, have, I, have, I have a um, question and concern. Looking at your um, your PowerPoint presentation. I noticed that you had um, two student assistants <coughs> from at Auburn University, three from the University of Alabama, five from Troy. Right. But you're right here now. I understand. We put out to all the universities and out through networks and to the universities saying we have these positions open. So we took the applicants as they came. This was not we had a very short period. We already we said we're missing. ASU, obviously, we're missing Huntington, we're missing Falkland, we're missing a lot of here. But that's one of those things that will be enlarged next year because we will have assistance. This was the first year we were able to do the assistance. Last year, our assistants were all NPS hired employees that were classroom assistants. This year, because of the grant, we wanted to move over and see if we could attract students. So, yes, I agree. Absolutely. Well, I know a couple of them that were student assistants, and I was wondering how they, how, how were they selected? <clears throat> Through an interview process. And we also sent all I mean, of the... how were they informed about the interview process? <clears throat> Those that applied, and the applications we put out through the colleges, we sent to schools of education, we sent to <coughs> student groups, we sent through people we knew that taught, because we had such a short time frame. I mean, if I send out something blind, you know, it takes following up, too. We also, Ms. Pitts had for all of the teacher positions, um, the, uh, the applications, you know, the job description there. I will tell you, most of our positions get filled through teachers who know and refer other teachers, who talk to others um, and say, you know, I heard about this. It's so much the work now. But no, I agree. Um, and we will have more time this year if we get the renewal to be able to do that. Mr. Dean? 
uh, and I had the opportunity to uh, visit the program over at Nixon. I just want to thank you. The, the students when, that we talked to were just so engaged and so excited about the program, as well as the teachers. So, um, you know, I love summer, summer programs, uh, and obviously, you know, the, the data is there that we need to do more of it. So thank you so much for your partnership, and we just need to do more. Um, thank you. Mr. Cornfield? The one thing that I noticed when I went over to Conover is that uh, you're somewhat in line, I think you are in line with CCRS, because not only are you getting the, um, when we look at the conceptual approach, but once they get that conceptual approach, you are actually um, putting the practical application and showing how it works in real life like situations. I had an opportunity to see that. So certainly a lot of success in what we're looking for as far as uh, preparing our children for life and certainly being aligned with the CCRS. And uh, I just appreciate what you're doing. Thank you, Mr. Cook, and I do appreciate you visiting. Um, this is that the children aren't just being taught to memorize and repeat. They really, you can ask any of the children, we had, I know you dropped in, this wasn't a dog and pony show, so I knew you were coming, some I didn't. You could walk up to any child, this is what they became used to after the first couple of weeks. What are you doing and why? And you got real answers. You know, the first week you heard crickets. After a couple, you know, our teachers really worked hard on that whole process. Student-owned learning. Um, they really owned what they were doing. So it made it, I think, a really real difference. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um, Rocky, Cassandra, Mr. Smitherman. Good evening. Good evening. It's just you. Just you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for having us. So it's good to be talking about good things in the in the schools. A uh, question was asked about the CST teams. How do we feel about it? I think it's great. We had a, we had a great meeting with our, our team. Had good guy, good dialogue. Uh, had continued support. That's great. Uh, the uh, success contract is just more ways we have to kind of affirm our commitment between the parents and the students and us. It's, it's a great way for us to communicate with them. But we're here to talk today about our agri-science program at Park Cross. And we have a, a growing, budding agri-science program Park Cross, we're going to have animals on campus soon. Uh, we're getting ready to install our, our fence for our goats. And our idea is to have a, a working mini farm where we're, we're going to grow our own corn on campus, uh, learn how to manage the animals. We plan on having some chickens and some rabbits as well. Kind of have a pre-vet approach on the animal side. At the same time, we have uh, the urban gardening garden. Uh, we've partnered with 4-H, and Ms. Shannon Andrews is our regional 4-H director. Uh, so we're going to have an urban garden, and we've got the Eat South folks at Hampstead that want to partner with us as well. So we're talking about all kinds of different things with kids, working outside in the dirt, managing the animals, uh, growing their own co uh, crops, getting the hand-on experience. And an extension of that that we're planning on starting is also a shooting sports club. And I know that the, the first instinct might be is uh, students and and guns and firearms is, ooh, you know, let's, <laughs> let's, let's think about that a little bit differently. Um, but they do have shooting sports clubs in other high schools yes. in Alabama. And all, as a matter of fact, Dr. Tommy Bice's son is, is on one of the shooting sports clubs. And it's a, my opinion that if they can be in other counties and, and other parts of the state and do it successfully, then there's no reason that our students at Park Cross and in Montgomery Public Schools can't do it as well. Um, so we're going to talk today about the about the benefits of that, and, and one of the one of the steps in the process that, that we took is we have a partner with Lower Wetumpka uh, Shotgun Sports Club. Uh, they actually reached out to Shannon to look for a school that might want to partner with them, and she contacted contacted us at Park Crossing, and I knew that uh, getting this thing started, we would need a little bit of a, a, a foothold uh, with you guys. So I hounded Dr. Blair, and I said, Dr. Blair, you're the you're chief that academic officer and I want you to understand um, the benefits academically of us having this program at Park Crossing and I convinced him to come meet with us at the, at the Shooting Sports Club and meet with Shannon and Mr. Smitherman and Matt Zinn, the owner, and we talked about um, all the benefits to all of our students and that's one of the benefit, one of the great things about having a program like this is any student can participate. You don't have to be athletically inclined, you don't have to be male or female. Um, the equipment has been provided through a grant. 
uh, any socioeconomic background can participate. Uh, even students in a wheelchair, and we have one in a wheelchair, they'll probably be interested in participating in this program. There's also benefits tied to colleges and universities. There are uh, programs at the next level. There are scholarships that are available for not only the shooting sports program, but also 4-H. Uh, those, are, those are important things um, to us. Also, Dr. Blair has expressed his uh, hope that we do vertical alignment with, with our feeder schools and our 4-H program. So, we start 4-H in the elementary schools, and they understand that uh, when you go through the Junior Master Gardener program at Wilson, and then you go up to John Carr, and you participate there, by the time you get to Park Crossing, you're going to have the ability to be an active member of 4-H, uh, apply for scholarships, and have exposure uh, there as well. There's also a lot of STEM curriculum that's involved in being a part of uh, the Student Sports Club, and Ms. Andrews is going to talk a little bit more about that. She's already done work in Montgomery Public Schools, partnering with the Arboretum, Fair Elementary, Ball Road Elementary, Lamp and Mellon, Pitlala, and Dunbar Raymer. So she's been in and around a lot of our students and schools uh, for quite a while. So I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about the program and how Auburn University and 4-H helps prop it up. Thank you, Rocky. It's my great honor and pleasure to be here with you tonight. I do represent the Land Grant University system here in Alabama that consists of Auburn University, <coughs> Alabama A&M, and Tuskegee. Specifically, I'm employed directly by Auburn University. The Land Grant University system was set up uh, back in the 1880s and 1890s through the Smith-Lever Act and the Hatch Act. So that means that every state has one land grant college for the purpose of teaching agriculture. But as we know, times have changed, and so we still dance with what brought us to the ball. 4-H is not just cow sows and plows, though. 4-H uh, is represented anything that a child could choose to pursue, to study, could be connected to an academic department at Auburn University. Auburn is a land grant, sea grant, and space grant college. So how does shooting sports play into this? Well, through the School of Forestry and Wildlife, we know that shooting sports is an important wildlife management tool. We also know that teaching young people about the importance of firearms safety and responsible gun ownership is critical. Research says that youth who are engaged in a you know, positive uh, instruction in firearm safety, handling, and responsible gun ownership, number one, are much less likely to be involved in accidents. Number two, you don't hear about them getting involved in incidents of gun violence. So let's move to the next slide really quickly. Um, I just want to tell you just really quickly what 4-H is. It's America's Youth Club. It's funded by an act of Congress. It's actually the only youth logo that is protected by an act of Congress. If you look real tiny on the side of the club, it says USC 909. That means that the clover cops can come get us if we misuse the clover. Uh, so uh, we are subject to the United States Department of Agriculture. But again, that being said, we're not just cow sows and plows. We have 4-H robotics clubs very active here. Um, Mr. Joe Williams through Tuskegee University does robotics clubs out at several schools. One of them is a private school. Uh, Resurrection, but he also does community robotics clubs. We have, uh, you know, marine science clubs. So we do a little bit of everything. So again, shooting sports is just one of many things that we do. And I do have to give a quick uh, shout out to Auburn University, which is the main land grant college through which the money flows, and it disseminates to A and M and Tuskegee. But uh, Auburn University also is coming alongside Park Crossing because we have, uh, we've got a, a $3,000 rototiller now donated for the school and we're going to have the universities donating different types of seeds so we can have the youth study uh, forage crops, uh, perennial and annual. Dr. Dale Monks, uh, who is one of our agronomists, is going to be helping us with that. So we we're really excited. So didn't mean to chase that rabbit, but there is a lot going on at Park Crossing. Next slide, please. Um, we say in 4-H, our 4-H pledge, I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living. For my club, my community, my country, my world. That's a beautiful pledge because we don't want to just teach kids what to think. Again, like so many of these wonderful folks in here tonight to talk about, we're teaching kids how to think. Um, the four H's, head, heart, hands, and health, also correlates with the Tufts University study. If you want to do, uh, and I'm happy to provide you with a copy of it, many of you have probably heard of it, and basically Tufts University about uh, eight years ago, they studied all the youth organizations in America, and they said of all the youth organizations, only 4-H has all four elements that uh, provide uh, a youth with what they need to be a successful adult. Not knocking any of the other wonderful groups, Boys and Girls Clubs, Boys and Girls Scouts, we love them. But we call it the big M, belongingness, independence, generosity, and mastery. 
And that's what 4-H helps provide. We provide that hands-on, minds-on, experiential learning where the kids actually go through, as, as uh, our previous presenter was talking about her wonderful summer program, it, it's very much in line with what the research says kids need. They need uh, that experiential learning cycle, do, apply, reflect. Um, so again, moving right along, I just you know want to show you that everything we do through 4-H is basically an extension of the Langer University system. We don't present it if it's not research-based and it's cutting edge when we do it. And we teach kids, but we also teach adults. We're about youth development as well. Next slide, please. Um, the purpose of 4-H shooting sports. Here in Alabama, we call it shooting awareness, fun, and education, or SAFE. Um, I believe there are some other points if you'll hit. Again, I mentioned firearm safety and responsible gun ownership because, you know, we just use firearms, you know, as, as a vehicle to teach positive youth development. Uh, you know, we're going to talk a minute, why shooting sports? Why can't they just knit or crochet? Well, you know, that doesn't interest everybody. We've, we've got to reach kids where they're at. And we know that there are, you know, give kids some offerings and give them opportunities. We are not necessarily worrying about, you know, you know, the competition aspect of it. We just want to teach them safety, but competition can be fun. As uh, Rocky mentioned, Dr. Bice's own son was on state for its shotgun championship team. Uh, that team is actually based out of Nichols Lawson, uh, and uh, they are one of the public schools in Talladega County. Uh, I believe there's another little point that will pop up. Uh, we talk about life skills, which is the driving force behind really all 4-H programs. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the life skills wheel is probably what you're going to see next. It was developed at Iowa State University. And so, you know, on this dimension of life skills, everything from teamwork to cooperation to goal setting, service learning, the desire to learn, these are all dimensions that 4-H, all 4-H projects teach. But uh, one of the things we like to do is we like to duplicate that little wheel in color and make kind of a little spin the wheel. So anytime kids are engaging in an activity, whether it's gardening, which, by the way, I just trained 50 teachers at Bayer to deliver Junior Master Gardener, which is a 4-H program, by the way. We do have Junior Master Gardener. Uh, and Cindy McKenzie utilizes JMG every day at the Arboretum. So that's where your chickens and rabbits are living until we can get the coops and everything ready, too, by the way. <laughs> just so you know. Uh, but we'll spin that wheel, and as the kids are doing something, uh, you know, engaging, maybe they're making dirt babies and studying plant growth and development, or maybe they're uh, learning how to follow a target as it falls, and they're studying trajectory. We'll We'll spin that wheel and say, hey, uh, how are you applying the life skill of uh, character today? And so kind of, you know, again, we're helping them bring it all together. Next slide, please. Is it safe to put firearms in the hands of youth? Well, we reach over 300,000 youth every year. And uh, this program has been operating nationally since 1980. 4-H Shooting Sports is the gold standard in youth firearm safety education. And it's recognized by Auburn University again. When my university, that's who I work for, Auburn University endorses it, we carry the liability on it. And I meet with risk management quarterly about the 4-H shooting sports program, and honestly, when we sat down with them, they said, you know, we're more worried about a kid getting food poisoning from the potato salad at a 4-H event than we are about a kid getting shot because the inherent safety that's built into this program. All of our 4-H club leaders, all of our shooting sports coaches go through an intense 15-hour training. And uh, they are taught not just how to teach a child how to shoot a bow and arrow or how to uh, you know sight in a rifle they're also taught how to teach children uh, the Sandusky incident was a horrifying thing several years ago at Penn State University and it's really awakened us in higher education to the importance also of child safety so we also train all 4-H adult volunteers how to touch a child preferably not but if you have to position a child or have to show them something ask their permission make sure there's another adult use the knife hands you know, and when the day comes that a kid can't come up to me and hug me and I can't show them, you know, some positive affirmation, that's going to be a bad day. But uh, so many times we as educators all remember that you may be the only smile that child gets that day. You may be the only kind word. You may be the, it's, it's very sad to me when I go and do a 4-H program uh, over sometimes at a community center, maybe at Chisholm. Children haven't seen me. They don't know me, Madam's house cat. I might do a two-hour program, and they'll beg me, Miss Shannon, can I come home with you? You know, because they think, well, gosh, you know, somebody was kind to me today. You guys are making a tremendous difference, and by allowing for us to come alongside of you, come into your schools, partner with you, you're bringing great opportunities for parent involvement, which we already know is a key indicator for the best schools. So you're also bringing to the resources that our University has to bear, potential grants for your classrooms. 
scholarships for the kids. Let's move along. I get so excited. <laughs> okay. Uh, we also have, you know, over 3 million members in contact over 32 years of shooting sports with very few incidents. And American Income Life ensures shooting sports at the same rate that they do other things, too. In fact, horse, our horse project and ATV projects, they ensure much higher. When the University of Risk Management was looking at shooting sports and are we going to support this, they said, by all means, they said, if you want to stop doing something dangerous, quit doing those livestock programs. But, you know, so that kind of shut us down as far as talking about stop anything because the university is not going to stop livestock programs. <laughs> so next one. Uh, there's only, over, in all these years, only five documented injuries, no fatalities, <laughs> and they weren't serious. Uh, next slide, please. Now, let's talk about what the American Academy of Pediatrics says about youth participating in sports, period. Uh, how safe is shooting sports? It's pretty darn safe. Next uh, slide, please, or next. Uh, uh, we know that, you know, three and a half million kids get hurt every year and everything from rollerblading to football. Uh, quite a few of them, almost a million, are treated in hospitals. I believe there's another slide. Uh, so let's take a look at sports. You just go ahead and click on through. We'll compare. Uh, you can just see the, uh, you know, the high incidence of, of high injuries in, in other sports. In fact, baseball, I think there were, you know, a few fatalities. I think if you make another click, you should see a red thing. Uh, give me another couple of clicks there. Yep. Baseball has, you know, three or four deaths a year. That's, you know, pretty sad. And up to 84 deaths a year in bicycling, mostly due to not, no helmets or, you know, getting struck by a car. So again, you know, we just want to sh tell you how safe the shooting sports is and, and reassure you that our university carries the liability on that. Next slide, please. Um, okay, let me say that the uh, State 4 H leader in Colorado, Dr. Jeff Goodwin, is who actually prepared the primary content of this uh, presentation. And there is, there's hardly a state anywhere, and you know that's where Columbine occurred that is more supportive of, shooting, of shooting sports because we know that those young people that were involved in that shooting did not have significant adult interaction in their life. They were missing something. They didn't have the big M, the belongingness, the independence, the generosity, the mastery that 4-H provides. So we know for a fact that the chances of this happening are very remote. Uh, go ahead and give me a couple more clicks, please, ma'am. Uh, again, it alludes to the significant uh, adults in the young person's life positive peer groups, positive family involvement. Again, it goes back to the development of those life skills and that positive youth development, which is the big M. Okay, next slide, please. Um, we talked about this a moment ago. Can't they just crochet or play football or something? Well, yeah, but you're going to miss some of the kids that are interested in hunting and shooting sports. And that's what I really admire about Rocky is that, you know, he recognizes that, you know, if, if, you, if you throw it out there, somebody's going to buy it. There's, there's, there's some child out there that's not a jock. There's some girl out there that's not going to be successful as volleyball or softball, but she's going to be successful in this. Um, it also makes the most of uh, hunting and shooting sports if, if there's a family interest. Hunting is a $6 billion with a B dollar impact uh, on Alabama's economy every year. And that's everything from, you know, sale of shotgun shells to your fuel for your ATV and hunting license. So, um, again, you know, we're also supporting, you know, something economic. But that being said, we don't necessarily push hunting. Uh, you know, shooting sports, the main goal is firearm safety, education, responsible gun ownership, teamwork. But sometimes, just sometimes, kids also end up learning to enjoy the natural resources and outdoors as well. Shooting sports does enhance your gender ratios, too, for your student athletes. And uh, it's going to bring those parent volunteers into your school. Next slide, please. Uh, I apologize that the fifth thing, go ahead and pop one more, dropped off the slide, but uh, it does the top five things that we do really well. We teach safety, responsible gun ownership. We facilitate that positive youth development, the big M, those life skills on the wheel, and also we teach adults to teach kids. Not at, we can't assume, all, most of us in this room are educators, and we do understand child development and how to work with children and how to teach children. But we don't assume that about everybody. So again, that's why we put all of our 4-H volunteers through criminal background checks, which Auburn University pays for, as well as an intense training, uh, not just to teach them how to teach the specifics of whatever it is, gardening, you know, shooting sports, horse. We teach them how to teach kids in a positive setting. So uh, again, the and the fifth thing is STEM. Uh, in shooting sports, we also have a very strong emphasis on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, and one example would be a little lesson plan with 
cheat lesson plan with, with a plastic spoon and a fruit loop. We call them fruit loop shooters, where you teach trajectory. You know, so everything, you know, you can study everything from trajectory and force to, you know, chemistry to, to biology. We have a really cool lesson plan with red vines, you know, those twisty uh, licorice things where kids use them like muscles because it takes muscle support and strength to hold, you know, a piece of equipment like a bow or a shotgun. So throughout all of our shooting sports curriculum, we are interweaving math and science, technology, and engineering. Next one. Well, that would just pretty much reflect our partners, Albany University. The extension system is, uh, and I do want to show you this, land-grant colleges, research, instruction, extension. All land-grant colleges have a three-pronged approach. I represent the extension part of it, and that means we are an extension of the university. I'm off-campus faculty, so we're bringing the university to you is essentially what we do. So there's shooting sports and 4-H programs in every county of every state, in every parish in America and we're here to support you work with you and we're so honored that Rocky is uh, interested in bringing this new opportunity to Park Crossing and if you have any questions I'd just be delighted we to have answer. questions <laughs> is, uh, is FFA part of this we, we have an FFA also so they're they're kind of Handy combined. love. right, right. You know, yes. there will be some students that are part of the FFA that will also be dual purpose in the before it okay um, is it rifle or shotgun? Well, for this purpose, we're just starting with shotgun. Right. But for at shooting sports, we we have discipline specific training for shotgun, rifle, archery, muzzle loading, hunting skills, and pistol. And okay. the rifle and pistol are air rifle and air pistol. Right. So the, is part of the training like you know I see the rifles in the Olympic sports. Yes. So would this be kind of a prerequisite or learning process to There is shotgun also in the, in the Olympic sports as well. And, and this could be an entree because our state yeah. competitive events that the youth would be able to participate in do go on to just to things like junior Olympics and right. scholastic track and ski and things like that where there are scholarship opportunities. We have lots of 4-H'ers who have won mm -hmm. full ride scholarships to some colleges like Birmingham Southern, Jack State, here in Alabama do offer full ride scholarships and shooting sports. We're working right now with Midway Foundation on starting something at Auburn University. Okay. Well after the meeting I want to give you the name of you know, we've got a world class skeet shooter here in this here in Montgomery who's retired that I would love to see him help you all with this program. We would too. That's great. One thing we, we want to emphasize that I've left it out. The firearms aren't going to be on campus. They're right. off campus at the rain. Right. All the, all the that's not that's fine. Yeah, that all would be our board policy. <laughs> <laughs> firearms on campus. We understand. We can we follow yeah. your board yeah. policy. Yeah. Because that's in line with the university. One sent home for a replica of a gun. And on another school campus, you can shoot a gun. I just, you know, thanks for answering that because that was puzzling me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and when Dr. Blair, Dr. Blair got to go shoot at the range, and he had a great time. He was he was impressed, um, and and he was the one that suggested that we come present to you all. The one on the board that he went to. Yeah. Board members, we do want to feel. We would love to. Take no. yeah. We would love to. We would love to. We we, we do have, have a process. <laughs> I, I have no, a few at times. No, no, no. Are there Thank other questions from the board? Great program. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the approval consent agenda. Okay. Uh, uh, agenda. Uh, 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 Madam President, I move that we approve the consent the consent. Agenda. It has been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda. In favor, let it be known by raising your hand. And the hands are up. All seven vote carrying the seven. The next item on the agenda. Is considered for approval. Um, Madam President, um, yes. On um, uh, on the transfers on the certified personnel menu, number twenty nine is coming on. A new hire is on the transfer. 
Is that support or certified? Certified. Certified. Page three. Okay. Which one? The certified? Yeah, page, yeah, page three. 29. Number 29. We'll make a correction. Okay. We'll make a correction. So approve the correction. Okay. We'll correct the heading. Okay. Do I have everybody's expulsion sheet? Yes, I already gave mine oh, to Renee okay. before the meeting. Thank you. Were there any other additions or corrections? Well, you, you, you admitted to reflect that approved with the corrections. Do you want to make that motion, Ms. Brown? I move that uh, the certified personnel minutes be approved with the uh, correction that Ms. Brown has just made. I second. It's moved and seconded that the Personnel report be included, be approved after the corrections that Ms. Breyers and Ms. Ross and Ms. Pitts agree to correct. All in favor, let it be known by raising your hand. Motion carries with seven votes. Um, board policy? And weapons. Yeah, the first thing is they can get more body still here. I recommend I recommend the approval of the board policy revision regarding weapons. Madam Madam President, I move that we approve the superintendent's recommendation. Second. It's moved and seconded that we approve the superintendent's recommendation on board policy revisions weapons. Those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carried with seven votes. Next. I recommend the approval of the board policy revisions on data governance. Madam President, I move that we approve the policy revision on data governance. Second. second. Has been moved and seconded that we approve the superintendent's recommendation on board policy revisions on data governance. All in favor, raise your hand. Motion carried with seven votes. Um, yes, did you approve both the certified and the classified together? Yeah. She had done that already. I thought I did. Let's take another day. You want to sure? Sign. Ms. Finch just had a question. Thank you. Um, please pay attention to the Combined meeting on October 22, I'm sorry, 21, 5 o'clock, and combined meeting November 18, also here, 5 o'clock. Are there any questions or any other items to come before the board? Are there other items to come before the board? Motion to adjourn. Second. A motion. Uh, all in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries. <laughs> <laughs> Meeting adjourned. <laughs>